Marcin opowiedział nam o wątkach i zajawił Project Loom. Teraz Andrzej Grzesik e, opowie nam więcej o projekcie Loom e, w Javie. Um, yeah, I think I should switch to English because this presentation is also uh, to be um, presented in English. So yeah, uh, Andrzej is uh, uh, one of the creators or a creator, the creator of Polish Geekon and uh, also a Java champion. I, I, I'm sure he will correct me on that if I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, he loves low-level stuff and has been developing uh, Revolut for over a year now. Um, let's connect with Andrzej. Hello? Uh, Hello, hi. can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I, I always am um, curious if it works. Uh, good to see you people. Uh, well, virtually, I can wave at you and you can well wave, with your, wa wave <laughs> in front of your computers. Uh, this is what we get. Hopefully, we can upgrade it uh, soon. Uh, welcome to my uh, talk. Uh, that's called the Corsair Looming. This is going to touch on Project Loom and uh, a bit more. Uh, so let's do the mandatory stuff first uh, as in Keynote Wake Up. My name is Andrzej Grzesik. As uh, it was already mentioned, I do work at Revolut. Uh, I've been there for oh, quite some time so far having fun. So obviously, if you're curious about Revolut, uh, maybe you would like to join Revolut. Uh, we are obviously hiring. Uh, talk to me after the talk because, well, today uh, we are going to talk about uh, Project Loom and focus on that. As it was already mentioned, I am uh, a Java champion. I'm uh, probably, it's correct to say, old enough to have gone to Java 1 and uh, become uh, one of the rock stars. So that's a, a good talk uh, award. I also am involved in organizing Geekon, but, well, Obviously, we've taken a, a pause recently and have been involved with Polish Java user groups, software Council, and Krakow, Krakow Hadoop user group, and a bunch of other things. My opinions are my own, which means uh, anything I say here is not representing Revolut's opinion, so don't, uh, don't uh, uh, connect that. Uh, I will be sharing my understanding and my, my excitement about Project Loom and uh, anything that... Uh, makes you that interest you about that so just just uh, ask me uh, ask the questions so there is discord and there is uh, inventory and if you do it uh, i should be able to react uh, and also if you have any questions about working at revolut talk to me after the talk i will try to stay around for sometimes if, if there are if there's anybody interested now focusing on the important things uh, pictures pictures are essential in any presentation uh, mostly because they are to remind me to drink something because otherwise my throat will go dry. And now uh, to the real uh, geeks and science fiction uh, fans uh, in the audience. Um, you can already figure out that I like dry jokes. Uh, so do, today you've probably had a chance uh, of uh, listening uh, a talk by Marcin, uh, which was everything that you wanted to hear about threads, but you were afraid to ask. Uh, if you listen to that and you now know everything, that's awesome because you now have the theoretical background for, for this one. If you didn't, or maybe you don't really speak Polish yet, obviously Polish is a great language. Uh, every every case is, is uh, worth learning, but uh, yeah, there are other materials. I'll try to explain what's what's needed. If you haven't, you haven't uh, you're not going to be at a disadvantage. So uh, we are going to start with why even this talk or why uh, what the problem is. Imagine this code, or even better, have a look at this code. This is uh, a Fibonacci uh, done in, uh, well, if anybody has just learned about uh, recursion and uh, executors framework and nothing about efficiency, uh, they might implement a Fibonacci like this. Uh, what uh, problem uh, will this create? Well, some of you already know, some of you, maybe not, because, well, nobody would probably try to write Fibonacci like this because it would take a while to execute for any any uh, decently big number. So here you can imagine I'm logging in and deploying this application into Oracle Cloud. And uh, if I do it like that, then the result looks like this. Probably uh, the video stream quality is excellent, so I will be very kind and I will zoom in. Uh, the error that we will start getting very, very soon is uh, called unable to create native thread, possible, possibly out of memory, uh, and so on and so on. Some of you have seen it. Uh, some of you who have listened to the previous talk, so I mentioned it, uh, already know uh, why it's there, what it, what it means. Uh, but I'm going to ask you one more thing. How many threads does your application run? As in, have you, have you tried? Have you tested? Uh, 
do you at least know the order of magnitude? Uh, why? Why would I ask this? Well, uh, the answer to this is uh, twofold. Uh, I used to use uh, this screenshot uh, for anything trading related. Uh, this shows an application that runs uh, 1,650 threads, and so at least the number of threads is stable. The question is, is it a lot? Obviously, like everything in computer science, it depends. Uh, but then sometime in, let's call it recent, uh, recent past, uh, I've had a chance to have a look at an application that uh, shown me something like this. Uh, the screenshot is from New Relic. Uh, yes, uh, Michal, you, you, you've won the award that I cannot give. So yeah, but but uh, good call. Uh, what is important in here is there is there is an application that obviously starts somewhere upwards of 10,000 threads. And uh, the number of threads goes up to 30,000, then goes down to 10,000, then goes up to 30,000. And then a few minutes later, the application disappears. Uh, obviously, the fact that the application disappears is, uh, is something that you can interpret in two ways. Uh, maybe the application has completed what it was intending to do and everything is fine and that's, uh, that's absolutely expected behavior, or maybe there is something wrong. In this case, I will uh, share the, the, the findings. Uh, the application uh, was creating way too many threads, as in the whole uh, hardware that, it, that was available to this uh, was half of what uh, all the threads uh, would actually expect to, to, to have. So the application was dying in painful death and uh, yeah, that has been fixed. Uh, now, why do I mention this? Because uh, there are two perspectives that you can look, uh, that you can take when looking uh, at threads. One is uh, the human preference, where we express, uh, we use threads uh, as uh, units of work. And this is what, uh, if you, if you want to actually hopefully represent it. Well, if I have a chunk of work, I put it in a thread, I ask the thread to execute, and I am just interested in the result. And then there is the, the hardware perspective, what's done in the operating system uh, when where threads is mapping one-to-one -to, -one to an execution unit to a, a hardware thread to an operating system thread. And that uh, bears some problems. Or the current state bears some problems. But let's talk about why this is uh, important and interesting uh, before we get uh, to the conclusions. So pictures, I drink. So you probably have seen this uh, famous quote by Leslie Lamport, uh, which says that a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. If you've heard about, uh, I don't know, uh, dog utensils, uh, stopping working because AWS in the US has a, a downtime and your do dog uh, cannot eat, then yeah, that's that's this kind of problem. If you remember your first computer, uh, you might uh, have had uh, something like this. You might have had something uh, that looked even, even older. Uh, it's not about who had what. Uh, the, the important uh, thing to compare with the current state is uh, they had much less RAM much less uh, cores, much less uh, power, and much less efficiency. Uh, if we take uh, a look over, uh, at what happened over history, and I took it from GitHub, the, the link is uh, at the bottom right. So if anybody wants the slides, just email me and I'll be very happy to share. Uh, the trends in microprocessors uh, evolution are as follows. Uh, first, let's look at frequencies. If you remember to the 2000s, uh, we were getting more megahertz and gigahertz uh, year by year. The problem is uh, that obviously stopped. Uh, we're still hovering roughly around, I don't know, two, three gigahertz. That's that's what a permanent usable uh, frequency uh, is. Maybe maybe four, maybe even five sometimes. But we haven't really gone into any anywhere further. I don't think any any one of us here has a six gigahertz uh, CPU that can keep running at six gigahertz. So the tre trend obviously uh, is not linear. The trend has plateaued, uh, but we keep buying new machines. We keep buying things. Uh, yeah, that's that's the plateau here. So then well, what else? What else can we look at? We can look at power. Power has been growing, 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 and then it has plateaued again. Uh, is that important? Well, obviously, because we don't uh, want to have a nuclear power plant. Uh, 
in every home uh, to be able to power the computing machine that we want to have. Uh, but also, the, the if you look at the machine scale or the enterprise scale of uh, CPU usage, if you're running a data center or if you have multiple data centers, uh, how much power the CPU consumes and how much power then uh, a CPU emits, which usually is emitted as heat, uh, has to be uh, relatively consistent because if you start adding 10% uh, more power out of a CPU and you have, uh, let's say, 100,000 CPUs within a data center, then your cooling infrastructure might uh, not work anymore or you put in less CPUs. And that means that whatever scales you've had built into the building and uh, that won't work anymore or will have to be adjusted, which is obviously not really what, what you want. You want to, if you have a building, you want the, the return on the investments uh, to be there and you want this to work for a few years. So we cannot really have CPUs that emit a few thousand kilowatts of heat because well, maybe if you're in the winter and you want to heat your entire home, that's a great thing. But apart from that, I don't think that's the most reasonable way, uh, use of energy. Let's have a look at another thing. What, what, was, what started to change around 2005? Uh, obviously, you know that already. Uh, logical number of uh, number of logical cores, number of logical cores and number of physical cores uh, has been going up and keeps going up and most likely will keep going up. Uh, how much? Well, so much uh, so that in 2010 it was possible to have 1,280 cores and be on the top 500 uh, supercomputer list. Uh, 1,280 cores. It's well, it's it's a lot and it's not a lot. Uh, right now, you you'll see in a second. But uh, this machine uh, looks looks something like this. Obviously, it's a supercomputer, so it had everything was very performant. Uh, but 2010, 1200 cores, and then we go into 2018, and the first machine in the list has 2.4 million cores. So you can see that the explosion in core counts has been tremendous. Keeping in mind the previous value, so the 1200 again. Uh, today at Amazon, or at the day I was uh, taking the screenshot, I can get a machine and I can have 448 logical processors available to me. So almost 500 cores, well, almost because it's probably, it is with hyper threading, so it's two to four, but still over 200. This is a, a terrible amount of processing power. Uh, the question, for because this is a Java track, can it will it run run Java? Can it run Java? So of course, it will run Java very well. Uh, the question that some of you might ask: oh, Okay, so should I call Amazon today and get those uh, terribly huge machines and run my Java applications in there? Of course, not so fast. Uh, and for consistency or well, um, exhausting the the search space. Uh, reasons uh, let's have a i had a look at azure as well i'm probably mispronouncing it of course terribly uh, 480 physical cpu cores and 960 virtual calls start that's uh, that's a thousand minus 40. Uh, so 10 years ago or 11 years ago because it's 22 21 uh, 1200 uh, cores was enough to put you on uh, the top 500 supercomputer list today uh, you can Call Azure, wait for them to procure and install the machines and enable them for you. And you can have uh, you can have a couple of these. Uh, if your credit card has limits big enough, that's that's just going to happen. So there has been progress. There has been a lot of progress, and those numbers mean that uh, things are changing. Obviously, if you have so many cores, uh, you want to achieve a state like that. The picture is from from H. That's actually a bit a bit of a smaller machine, just uh, 128 cores, uh, just to two terabytes of RAM. Uh, but if you have all those cores, you want them to be utilized. Uh, if you want, if they are not being utilized, then you have bought very expensive hardware for a lot of money, and uh, you're not using that, and that's that's quite inefficient. Unless, well, your goal is for nobody else uh, to have them, or you're some sort of a miner, and you want uh, nobody else on the planet to have access to computing hardware, then yeah, of course, uh, you've achieved what you wanted. For us programmers, though, uh, the conclusion is very simple. The conclusion is that we are living and we are working in a multi-core uh, world. Uh, the single-threaded, single-core uh, mindset is no longer fully applicable. It's absolutely very useful and you shouldn't unlearn it, but the reality is multi-core. I'll try to prove my point. Let's, uh, well, Raspberry Pi, four cores, 
uh, a random fridge uh, from from the internet four cores a tv has four cores a phone has well eight and and more cores uh, a reasonably recent intel cpu has uh, 10 cores and then luckily then there has been some competition from amd who st- who started pushing more and more cores into the consumer market so there is uh, there are the the ryzen uh, the, the home destined ryzens that give you 16 physical cores and then there are the thread rippers which are Pro professional market, but still desktop CPUs. You can just go to Amazon and buy it and, and install it and have a desktop running probably tomorrow if Amazon Prime is uh, kind enough for you. And you can have 128 uh, logical cores or 64 physical in a single CPU. A few years ago, that would have been a very, very, very beefy server and very expensive as well. Probably not a single CPU package. So obviously, a couple updates. Then there is the iPhone that has uh, 16 cores, and uh, well, recently Intel did something very strange, in which uh, their highest level consumer grade CPU has decreased the number of cores available. But I'm not going to talk about Intel. I'm not an analyst of them. I ju- I just find it funny. Uh, why do I mention this? Because obviously I'm that slow and we're here very smart. So I show you the formula. You can draw the conclusions already. You know what I wanted to say. We can probably finish this presentation here. No, of course not. One way of understanding Amdahl's law in an oversimplified fashion, of course, so is that parallelization is proportional to the part of syst- to the amount to the part of the system that can be made parallel, which means the more non-parallel uh part the, the bigger that, that part of your system is the less you will get by having more parallel parallelism what does it look on a chart on a chart it looks like this uh, so uh the blue line shows what are the perform what what are the, what is the speed up as you add cores if 50 percent of your software is uh non not prone to to being made parallel. The green line though is uh, similar for uh, 95%, uh, sorry, for 5% of of serial uh, piece of software. So you can see that there is a huge difference between what the blue line and what the green line does anywhere between, well, actually, well, anywhere from the beginning, uh, past one core up to, up to what, 4,000 threads? Even at, at, at a thousand threads, the, the difference is huge. Why is this relevant to us? Why is this relevant to us? Well, especially now in 2021 and onwards. A uh, couple of reasons. First of all, uh, when multi-core CPUs were coming into play, uh, it was very easy to just delegate uh, other, some tasks to other background threads and uh, take uh, and benefit uh, from this free pal- parallelism. Uh, because we were exploiting the left side of the chart. Every core that you added made a difference, probably uh, not putting uh, the the software to its limits, because even simple applications, the the heavily single-threaded applications, can had some tasks that could be made parallel, and everybody was happy, because we were getting machines that have two, maybe four cores, tops, and this is is what we were dealing with, which means everybody observed speed up, there was a rationale to buy new CPUs, and everybody's happy. The problem is, uh, that was a few years ago, uh, well, let's say 10. Today, we're more in this space, which means uh, the less parallelism we have in our applications, the less speed up we are going to observe, which means uh, the most efficient way to deploy our applications might be uh, to deploy many single-threaded applications rather than putting them on a large system, for example. Uh, or if you want to have an application that really spreads nicely over many, many cores, uh, you have to think about how you program it because the parallel portion has to be very big, which means uh, life becomes difficult. Uh, or there is another way of interpreting Amdahl's law. Again, a simplified one because we could do an entire session uh, on, on interpreting this uh, this equation and it could be a very intense one still. The more you share, the more state you share, the more data you share, the more interdependencies uh, within your software uh, are, the less you can parallelize. So ideally, obviously, ideally share nothing. Uh, algorithms for that have been theoretically 
uh, researched and explored since 1960s, 1970s, uh, things like divide and conquer, things like map reduce. Uh, although not all, but a huge theoretical background for, for distributed computing is, is already uh, present and quite well researched. Obviously, there is still space to do more PhDs and to write more master's uh, thesis uh, about anything distributed because, yeah, everybody can do it and it's quite accessible and it's, it's going to be a very uh, applicable uh, thing to us. But uh, for us, uh, programmers, if we need to build to get the building blocks, uh, we already have them. They are well defined, they are described, they are available in many languages, including Java. And uh, yeah, if we look at Java, uh, if somebody wants a modeling exercise, so how can I write software so that I share nothing? I usually say to people, uh, try to express your uh, problem using Akka or Vertex and, uh, and, and see how you go. Anybody who tried it uh, will know that it's not it represents a change from how we do software normally, uh, but hey, well, this is this is uh, this is how you want to to, to go on if, if 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 you want to share nothing, uh, and that's all great, up to the point in which you actually work somewhere and you want to you have a system already and yeah. You have a system. You're not going to rewrite it on Twilight, let's say Akka, because uh, I, I just said so, us, and it would be really good if, I, if my voice carried that amount of power. But that's not there yet. Uh, so yeah, with many cores, um, there come some problems. And let's talk about uh, part of the the hardware. Uh, related or induced problems that we have with with multiple cores, because typically, if you want to have many, a lot of cores in a system, or if you look at a typical server machine that you are going to work with, it's probably going to have uh, let's say two or four physical CPUs uh, in in the machine. I took a random picture from the internet of a, of a multi-core workstation. Typical layout is as follows: you will have uh, two physical CPUs. And there will be RAM, uh, memory banks uh, associated with uh, with the CPUs. And uh, then how it's logically connected, uh, oh, it's, it, it looks like this. So the consequence is very simple. CPU one wants to retrieve or maybe store something that uh, in memory that belongs to CPU zero. And then it has to actually use CPU zero as a, as a jump platform. Uh, this thing is not new. It's, it's something that's very well researched. There are tools in your operating system to work with this. Uh, uh, this is, is actually has a name. It's called non-uniform memory architecture. Why non-uniform? Because uh, memory accesses uh, vary depending whether you own the memory as, as the CPU or not. And, uh, and, and that's it. That's it. And uh, that thing was a thing for many years. And uh, anybody that was doing uh, programming and performance on multiple multi uh, CPU machines is, uh, is is familiar with with uh, to a degree with with Noma, but then we come to a catch with CPUs that we're going to work with. The CPU catch is twofold. And the first uh, is quite evident in this picture. I'll let I'll let you catch it, or I'll drink something. And so, uh, yeah, the, the careful person would say, hey, do I need to study CPUs now? Uh, obviously, the answer is no, maybe a bit, but not really. The problem is here. And uh, the, 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 the here represents the, the memory interface. All the cores will have to get through it. All of that, that's, a, that's an Intel CPU uh, on the diagram. So let's have a look at what is uh, Threadripper doing. So what is AMD doing in their bigger CPU packages? Uh, they are using uh, compute units, so the, the CCDs, which have uh, some amount of cores, and then they use a bus within the CPU that connects to the memory controller, which means this CCD has to talk through Infinity Fabric, if I'm not mistaken, to talk to the memory controller. Or it has to talk to even more Infinity Fabric if it wants to somehow communicate with uh, another core, because I don't know, you've used a synchronize and you, you, you want to agree on the state. Uh, what is the conclusion? 
to you as, as developers? Well, first, uh, CPUs will start behaving differently when it comes to multi-threading. You will see uh, the effects that were present on servers on single machines now because more and more chips, more and more computers, more and more uh, devices will have will behave like multi-CPU multi uh, machines, even though they might have a single CPU package because even a single CPU package might be under the hood built from smaller chiplets, well, building blocks. Uh, what it means to you as, as people doing uh, multi-threaded software is test on the architecture that is similar to what you uh, to what you intend to run because the effects might surprise you. But I said that there are two things that we need to look uh, on here. And I pointed to you at the memory controller and that is for a reason because there is a memory bandwidth gap and the memory bandwidth gap is visible here on the chart. Uh, CPU, over the overall performance of, of CPUs has been increasing uh, steadily year by year. Uh, memory performance, on the other hand, uh, has not been so quick to catch up. And somebody who knows uh, things might say, hey, but we've had dual channel, not we, then we had uh, quad channel, then we had hexa channel, then we have octa channel and, and uh, many other things. And then we have DDRs and we will have other things. Still, the bandwidth is quite, uh, quite, quite limited. Uh, what that translates into, uh, well, obviously bandwidth, a, one thing, and you have, to talk, you have to talk through the CPU to access uh, the memory. And then second thing is the, the, the lookup uh, latencies are a thing and they don't want to change. Uh, I'm just going to hint at latency numbers every programmer should know. Again, another great source of information and another great source of uh, research. Uh, but the architectures that we are working with right now have a limitation because they have this memory controller that's a bit of a blocker. Uh, that's a bit of a blocker. That's a blocker to a degree so big that NVIDIA has realized that they want to uh, challenge this uh, architecture. They want to have a memory to GPU interface that's going to be available to, to, to everything because we used to have something like this or we have something like this. CPU is the bottleneck, not because CPU is slow. It's just that there is a, a bandwidth limit that you cannot uh, you, 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 you cannot cross. So they want to go directly to memory in their uh, in their new proposed architecture as in we'll, we'll see how it works. We'll see when it is uh, out because this is taken from uh, their presentation from uh, I think April. So those those uh, slides are quite uh, quite fresh. But obviously they've noticed uh, the same thing. This needs uh, the design principle needs to be challenged. And what does it? What does this give us? The conclusion is very simple. The conclusion is that every system becomes a distributed system. Remember the definition. Any part that's not local to, to what your software is doing or not local to your current thread core that, that breaks can render your part broken. Uh, this means that if you're running multiple cores and then somebody else does something stupid to your data, well, your system is, is, is broken. Uh, also, it means that compute location is... Uh, will challenge uh, how we approach uh, the current uh, client server models. Because uh, with uh, phones, with uh, PlayStations, with TVs, with fridges uh, becoming more and more powerful, uh, compute location is going to be a thing. So we used to process on the server, but we have uh, increase in quality and capability uh, that enables us to do computation on the edge. Because it is quite inefficient to take a, a very high a resolution video stream of what your phone sees to send it to the server so that the server can do, I don't know, augmented reality there. Uh, I won't even touch uh, security and data privacy part here. It's because that would be too big. Uh, but this processing has to happen locally. Uh, but what it means to us is we will have to worry about, uh, can we trust the results that have been calculated on the edge? And can we integrate it with the data that comes from the server? What becomes trusted location of computing? What becomes non-trusted? Will be a thing, but that's that's an area of uh, of relevance. But the primary focus that we still have to have here in the Java track is how this affects me, the an engineer that probably writes Java. Who writes Java here? Well, two kinds of people: backends uh, and 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 mobile. Mobile engineers uh, have 
the, the luxury of having multiple cores on their on their phone. Uh, that means that they will be the, their phones are uh, as powerful as powerful now as servers used to be. A couple well, so let's say fifteen years ago, uh, they will be doing distributed programming, distributed uh, maintaining a distributed system if their application is complex enough on their phone. Uh, what about front ends? Hey, well, but but what about front ends? Well. Frontend has the concept of web workers, which means you can spawn threads or thread-like uh, entities uh, in the browser. You can have background tasks, and even though you have to still use the the abomination of the language, uh, that you still have uh, access to mm, parallel processing uh, primitives there. And of course, as backend engineers, as people doing banking and non-banking and uh, uh, all kinds of software uh, with Java. Well, we will have to uh, change what how we approach threading. Uh, we will have to work with systems that uh, all are effectively are distributed systems. Uh, multi-core is a thing. CPUs are multi-core, and uh, not all cores might be the same because they might be further from memory. They might have actually different speeds and completely be of, the, of different kind. And soon uh, we will also get that not all cores are Intel x86. ARM is a name that you know of. ARM is the name that you've, you've, uh, you've, you've seen. You can get ARM-based machines from Amazon as well. Uh, it, it, it's a thing and it's coming. Second part, second takeaway to us, as in what should I do, what should I explore tomorrow is events. If you're not programming in events, I'm not saying you should, but if, you've not, if you're not familiar with some of the eventing concepts, then that's a good area to do research on. Uh, similarly to distributed uh, computer science, well, distributed anything, computer science papers, uh, they will keep applying, they, they will keep their applicability. And there is a lot of research already done. There is a lot of presentations already done. Some uh, links are here, uh, very good uh, starting points. Uh, but what we have to do as programmers is explore alternative, alternative concurrency models. Uh, I said Akka, I said uh, Vertex, and I uh, we will get to Loom, or we are getting towards Loom. Now, threads. And I say thread wars, because that brings a picture. <sighs> yeah, so what is Project uh, Loom, or why Project Loom? Why am I so excited about Project Loom? You, well, you 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 see the history, you know the history, you know uh, the, the the situation uh, we are in. And uh, short primer for about about uh, threads in Java. Obviously, you know, you, you know it all. Uh, they map one to one onto operating system threads. They are quite expensive to create. Because they take it takes time for an operating system to spawn a thread. Uh, they take around one megabyte, one megabyte and a half order of uh, rule of thumb uh, amount of memory. Don't quote me on the numbers. They are quite expensive to use because, for example, context switching, and they have quite limited populations. As in, you've seen the picture. You cannot easily create uh, thirty thousand threads because that that's going to explode. Which means uh, you will have to explore explore various uh, different kinds of pools. Uh, some of uh, which have been explained in the previous presentation. Uh, if you haven't seen it or you don't speak Polish, uh, that's another good uh, good thing to read uh, or to watch uh, on YouTube. Uh, also from Allegro. Coincidence. I don't, I don't know, but this is a, this is a good one. And so we're getting towards Loom. Towards Loom, what happens if we build an application like this? Start one min million threads. Every single thread, instead of doing something actually useful, uh, but I'm very bad at uh, pretending to do business logic here, uh, it just increments a counter. Uh, the result is. As you've, as you know, as you've seen, uh, unable to create native thread, possibly out of memory process resource limits uh, reached. Uh, that looks like a quite innocuous error, because well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, one uh, funny thing is this is not me trying to do something uh, fancy with I don't know radar waves. This is when I tried to exceed the limit, well, to reach the limit of uh, threads created on 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 SX. The system just fell flat on its face. So creating too many threads might destabilize your system because it's a it, it's an operating system limit. So what is the limit? Uh, one way to look at the limit is just to see a relevant uh, limit in the 
proc three one zero two eight nine seven three but we haven't been able, we haven't seen uh, that many threads being created so uh, let's try to run that after I've shown you how many threads can we actually spawn. Uh, I started getting problems when uh, having created 17,000 threads. This wasn't a terribly tuned machine and the machine and, and the operating system were not tuned at all. It's, it's just, okay, let's let's see how, I, how far I can get. Uh, given I have enough RAM and I have enough resources on the machine, still the operating system operating system started to chuckle uh, around that, uh, around that uh, amount. And now here comes Project Loom. If you're thinking about lunch or you're all sleeping, Loom will be lightweight, cheap to create, uh, user mode as opposed to so operating system uh, space uh, threads that will be scheduled by the JVM. So to the operating system, some number of Java threads, whatever happens inside, it doesn't care because the JVM does everything. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, when we run Loom and you can see this uh, thread start virtual thread as opposed to start, uh, the difference is that this will happily continue and, and, and complete and uh, works very well and that's it. And I could finish here, uh, but I wanted to. I want to explain the whys and talk about the whys so that you understand why I'm so excited about Project Loom and uh, why I think it's uh, so important for us to to have it. But we have to get it. Somebody, <laughs> I appreciate the no no limit, but I will not try to sing. Uh, when we write code, uh, blocking synchronous code, uh, we do it not because we want to be inefficient. We want it to do because it's it's easy because uh, we've been taught to program in an imperative fashion. Uh, and then we accept that blocking calls will make our suboptimal re resource usage acceptable because we still won't worry about correctness. Mm -hmm. An example of this, we have a service. Uh, the service needs to call to a database. Then the service needs to call another microservice. Then it needs to call another microservice. All the time spent uh, during the calls is from the execution efficiency point of view, completely wasted. Somebody could say, yeah, you should paralyze those calls. Somebody could say, hey, you should uh, switch and do something else uh, in instead of just waiting. And you would all be correct. This, those are very, very correct reactions to do that. This is what we do. This is why we actually sp spin up more threads than uh, originally needed uh, to try to somehow navigate that waste. Another option is to use non-blocking APIs. They are necessary to incre increase utilization. As in, You've, uh, if you try to do your own HTTP server or well any, anything that, that operates with threads and uh, TP, TCP sockets, you are either going to do, you're most likely want to, to go NIO if you want to have decent efficiency, or you're going to use Netty, which does it for you. Uh, they are a bit hard to develop because you cannot have such a very simple mental model in which uh, you just uh, do your chunk of work and you're not interested in, in, in any other because you have to... Uh, share and, and 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 coordinate. They are hard to debug because, uh, yeah, if you want to debug a stack trace from an unblocking IO and there are multiple chunks of work in flight, well, good luck. It's it's it is possible. It's just complicated. Uh, they are hard to profile because how do you attribute uh, what each part of the request was taking if you are running ten thousand of them at the same time and they are not aggregated by a thread or something similar, and. The biggest complexity to us programmers is you need to remap your linear problem or linear solution as in call database, call service, call service onto something asynchronous. Uh, this is why I mentioned Akka. If you try to express your problems with futures and, uh, and actors and calls, uh, combining all the results makes com code slightly more complex. It's doable. You can manage this complexity. It's, it's not terribly undoable. As in we've, we've deployed systems with Akka and uh, they were running very, very well. The problem is it's, it's just uh, that switch is, 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 is complex. It's not something that you do like a drop-in. Another option is to use callbacks. And I'll use a picture actually from, from JavaScript because uh, the callback hell website mentions uh, JavaScript, but if you get a callback to a callback to a callback to a callback, whenever a callback to a callback was finished, uh, I think you get the idea where I'm at. So it is prone to explode in complexity. Uh, and now enter Project Loom, finally. What if I told you that creating threads is cheap so that you don't need to pull, you just create them as you need them and let them do their job. 
And this in, in a few words is exactly what Project Loom aims to do. The migration of a Java application from non-Loom uh, code to Loom code looks like this. So you can see the difference is not very huge. The API looks very similar. And this is uh, exactly the goal. The goal is to have all, an almost drop-in replacement uh, or augmentation of existing APIs that will allow to use uh, uh, Loom threads uh, or fibers to uh, have uh, to let them do what uh, typical heavyweight threads uh, on the JVM side used to do. This is how you start a virtual thread in Java. Uh, it comes and started because there is no, you don't want to pull because there is no need to pull because there's, it's cheap to create and it's cheap to run. And it, well, it's as expensive to run as, as your business logic inside. But you can say, you can say whether you can figure out whether a thread that you're running is virtual and uh, you can just start it and let it uh, do its job. Uh, so, Java fibers. What are Java fibers? They are lightweight threads. They are implemented natively uh, by the JVM uh, with support from the runtime. Uh, when I say implemented natively on the JVM, I mean they are part of the standard library and uh, they are not provided to you as magic by the compiler, by some sort of library that would do bytecode weaving or anything like that. They are actually... Well, they are in the JVM. They have runtime support, uh, which means the JVM will be aware of fibers and all or most of the tools that you expect to use uh, and, and work with uh, Java should work with, with fibers. It should be quite, a, quite, an easy quite an easy transition. And they should work with all the existing or most of the existing building blocks, blocking, clocking, collections, exceptions, uh, semaphore, stack traces, uh, and so on. So in theory, what you might then end up doing is something like this. And because it's a native uh, implementation with support from the Java platform, the platform support part of the sleep is actually now, or in the project Loom uh, branch, uh, becomes uh, Loom aware. So they will figure out, okay, is this uh, thread that I'm dealing with, is the sleep call from a normal thread? Because if it is, then yeah, you do the normal sleep uh, and don't do thread.sleep normally too much. Uh, but if it's a virtual thread, what, what actually happens is, okay, this is a virtual thread. We can post this execution for the uh, expected amount of time. And then we don't block anybody because just some, some other uh, virtual thread can continue. Similarly, another example, uh, an IO socket implementation, uh, it is uh, virtual thread aware, and so on and so on. I could go through multiple, multiple examples. Most of the blocking uh, or important classes and uh, blocking calls uh, will be migrated uh, to Loom awareness. So this is something that uh, Java as the platform will give to you when you try to migrate. And then somebody might ask, okay, how is, how is this happening? How is this, this, uh, this going on? Well, it's, it is very simple on principle. Uh, Loom, well, fibers come with schedulers. Scheduler, uh, similar concept, exactly the same concept as an operating system uh, uh, scheduler, but it's written in Java and works within the Java platform, uh, will order around fibers that are being uh, scheduled for execution. And the your custom scheduler, because you might be able to, to write one, and I will get to, to why it might uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, re can, re for example, register a, a request to, to run a specific uh, bit of code. And then, well, you might choose to do something, well, some trivial implementation, which you just uh, decide to, I don't know, I, I will start the fiber every time somebody uh, wants me to execute a runnable and I'll be happy. Or maybe I will want to limit the number of uh, fibers being executed because I don't know, I'm trying to, to do something else or, or maybe something else. But you are able, or you should, you most likely will be able to do that. Now, Going on, uh, how is that going to be implemented? That's going to be implemented with something continuations, uh, something called continuations. And uh, there is an API for this. The API looks like this. Uh, 
The API looks like this as of now because there is a catch. This is all work in progress. And this is all work in progress, which means the APIs and the, the research part is taking place. Of, of course, the, the modifications to the JVM and the Java, uh, to the Open JDK do take place, but they are not merged in the, into, the, into master or main. Should I, can I still call it master? Uh, so that's one. And second, some of the APIs are aimed to not be usable directly. Whether they eventually will or not, it's it's an open question because as you can see this email, this email explicitly says, uh, continuations will not be usable directly. So most likely you will not be able to use uh, them directly if this email from now over a half a year ago is, is going to remain valid. So that brings us to the questions part. And the questions part, I'll help you, uh, I'll help you start. There is Discord and there is even uh, inventory. I have both open. So if you type something there, uh, I should be able to react. First question that you will most likely ask is where can I find Project Loom? Uh, builds are on JDK Java Net and you can find an alternative, uh, well, you can find builds of Project Loom, but this is work in progress. Uh, so builds are coming, builds have uh, mistakes. Uh, sorry, builds have uh, come with bugs and uh, it's it's a good thing to experiment with. It's a good thing to, to have a to play with. It's not something that you want to run in production or not something that you will migrate to within the next, let's say, a few months, definitely, because it, it will be ready when it's ready. Uh, the second question about uh, the, the whole multi-core uh, part of the story that I've given you, you hopefully now, now, now understand that working with multiple cores is something that you should uh, invest some of your time uh, into. How, do you, how can you build your multi-core intuition? The easiest way is uh, to work with a multi-core machine. And I'm not saying a multi-core uh, MacBook because no offense to Apple's products, but you probably want some real hardware, uh, something that ideally has uh, maybe to CPUs, you can get used hardware. You can look for uh, used hardware on Allegro. You can look for it uh, on eBay. There are sites like this. It's going to be probably an older computer, but you don't need the state of the art, most likely, if you just want to build your intuition and get a bare bones operating system. I will keep recommending using Linux for it because it has a lot of libraries and a lot of examples about how, how to get there. And there's a little uh, amount of things that get in the way, but this is also because I don't work with Windows on a normal basis. So I Maybe it's also possible to do with Windows, but I don't know. Uh, next question is, who is going to use uh, Loom directly? Who is going to work with the APIs that Loom exposes? The primary consumers are going to be framework and library build, build, builders, curious people, so yeah, like me, uh, and students, well, people doing research. You as uh, backend engineers are most likely not going to be directly affected by Loom that much because you will just keep using, I don't know, let's say, uh, uh, Jetty or Tomcat or something else. And that's the Jetty or, well, Jetty or Tomcat will actually have migrated to, to Loom or uh, the underlying libraries will have migrated to Loom. So you will not have to do a huge, a terrible, huge migration uh, in order to be able to, to benefit from, from Loom. The logical follow-up is, should I use it in production? Can I already use it in production? And sadly, the answer is uh, no, not yet because it's not ready. When it will be ready, I nobody knows. The, the, the only correct answer is when it's ready. Uh, as soon as it's ready, uh, it will be merged into the main JDK branch and it will be a huge, there will be a huge wave of uh, news all around the, the internet uh, that Loom is, Loom is out or Loom is coming, uh, but sadly it's not yet. If you have your own hobby projects, it's a great thing to experiment with. And if you find bugs, obviously submit them to uh, to the to the people to the working group that works on Loom because everybody wants it to to become to become good to become a, a thing. And uh, bugs and finding and, and fixing bugs is part of the problem. Any more questions? No. So. Last uh, bonus uh, piece of news, because it is a thing that keeps coming back. How do I get uh, the colors that I have in my IDE? Uh, I use something called semantic highlighting and uh, rainbow brackets, another thing. Oh, I have questions. 
Do you think that Project Loom will become a replacement for frameworks like Reactor? Uh, I will not. I don't think that uh, Project Loom will be will will replace Reactor. So if somebody is using Reactor, they will have to replace it. I think that Reactor is going to use and delegate to to Loom uh, instead of uh, delegating to existing uh, thread pools. So some of the APIs are going to be probably enriched to allow for for Loom, and you will be able to do some things with Loom that now uh, Reactor gives you. But the this is only a tiny fraction because Rea Reactor is giving you reactive APIs and it's not Project Loom's goal to give you an end-to-end -end reactive API environments, a uh, set of APIs. Uh, so it's like, can I can I replace my car with, with, with an Apple? Yeah, I can put my Apple in my car, but they, they are not really the same thing. So I don't think it's going to be a replacement. It's going to be a thing that works together nicely. That's more of, more of a way to, to look at it. And I can see another question. Loom X Reactor IO. What are the main differences regarding threads process source management? I don't think we have the time to talk about Reactor IO uh, because uh, threading and then processor management uh, they're enough. Asen, I'm happy to to chat to you on on Discord and then we can try to explore. But I would not call myself a Reactor expert, uh, primarily because I don't work with it. Uh, uh, in anger a lot. Uh, if I have to do something that should work, that has to deal with a, a significant amount of data or a significant amount of computation, my framework of choice is Aka. Uh, there are projects, there are things that are going to use and are using Reactor and they are very, very successful. It's just, I don't use Reactor as much. What does it go, what is it going to mean to me when Reactor switches to Loom? Uh, ideally, if all uh, go if all goes according to plan is going to be a drop-in replacement. You have a, a, J, a JDK that is Loom aware, or you have a JDK that supports Loom. Sometime later, a, a follow-up, uh, following uh, implementation of Reactor comes out, and you just start using it, and you will see less uh, system CPU usage. You will you will see less operating system threads uh, produced by uh, the Java virtual machine, and everything else should work as expected. Ideally, that should be that transparent. Unless you are using some specific scheduling, some, some more precise, uh, well, you want to uh, narrow down the thread poles and, and do something that and might be, it might be that you will need to adjust some of your, your, your logic or you're using some of the APIs that uh, the J JDK authors uh, have not or will not uh, be able to uh, make fully Loom aware, then you will need to, to adjust them. Uh, but ideally, if you're in a, in a in a happy path, if if you're not doing something uh, non-standard, uh, then you should just have a drop-in. Uh, the list of APIs is uh, it's not a non-exhaustive list of uh, blocking APIs that are not going to be made Loom aware is available on uh, one of Loom uh, Project Loom's uh, pages in the wiki. I can add it to the presentation probably uh, when I after this talk. Okay, I think, thank you very much for answering the questions. Uh, we don't have uh, a lot of time left, so maybe we can move that to the chat area. Thanks so much. I Andrei. think that's a great idea. Thank yeah. you so much. Have a great day. Thanks so much for the presentation. Next up, we'll have Michał Rowicki uh, talking about writing tests in 2021.